morning. morning. It's such a privilege to be here. It's my first year at a Steubenville conference uh, because, yeah. (laughs) Because 30 years ago, when the conferences started, I was turning atheist uh, a few thousand miles east of here. Um, So, um, as Scott mentioned, I grew up in Turkey. And I wanted to begin my uh, talk to give a little bit of a background about Turkey because it's kind of a country that's stuck in between East and West. Um, Turkey is predominantly Muslim, over 99%, as Curtis mentioned um, on Friday night. And um, yet at the same time, if uh, you visited Turkey, there's a lot of Western elements. It's not like the other Muslim countries because After the First World War, when the Ottoman Empire collapsed, uh, the founder of modern Turkey uh, wanted to westernize the country because he thought um, that he thought that uh, the empire collapsed because um, the country didn't keep up with the Western technology and innovation. I don't think he was Muslim himself, but he also understood that for the Turkish national identity to stay strong, Um, there needed to be a religious element, right? So what happened is that he imposed all these Western ideals of laicism, which is like the French uh, secularism, where the state um, is over, uh, oversees the religion. And um, he forced people to wear the Western garb. Nobody was allowed to cover their heads or wear the Ottoman um, male headgear fez and then he uh, we used to use the Turkish, I mean, Arabic alphabet. Turkish is a language on its own, but we just use the Arabic script to write. So he changed that to the Latin script. So um, Turkish alphabet is like similar to the English one with a few extra funny looking letters with dots and stuff. Um, so there was this like outwardly um, art change within the country's appearance, but at the same time, of course, Uh, Turks have been Muslims for a long, long time. And of course, that stayed as the the major part of the country. So as growing up, this meant that for me, I would, um, we went to a school and, you know, we, everybody wears uniforms there. Uh, In the winter, we went to the school and learned about all these Western ideals of, you know, uh, equality of women and and men and um, secularism again and read about, kind of read about Western history with, um, you know, kind of a favor, favoring the, uh, of course, the Ottoman history. So, and then in the summers, we all wore our, you know, headscarves as girls and long sleeves, long skirts, and went to the local mosque to learn how to read the Quran in Arabic, right? So it was kind of this, this being stuck in the, in between the, in between two worlds. Um, so uh, what this also meant within the society or within, uh, uh, within life is that for me, in my family, um, like my mother worked a full-time job, but he, she was still supposed to come home, um, you know, cook three courses of meal every day and, you know, wash the dishes, do the laundry and all that stuff. So she was getting like the worst of the Western ideals of feminism, right? And the worst of the Muslim world of still, she needs to be in charge of everything. And um, another aspect of this, um, this Muslim um, social structure was that uh, the man was still over women. If you were there, I kind of talked about this idea of servile fear and filial fear. Um, So because Allah is the master of the Muslim, that trickles down to the society, right? So then the man um, is a master of women. So it's not like the way we see uh, marriage in Christianity. It's a completely different understanding of marriage. So, um, So my parents' marriage has always been rocky because my mother is really stressed out and my father still has all these expectations. And at the same time, my father happened to like women a lot. Yeah. Um, so what happened is, and this, I mean, 
this is very common in Muslim countries, and even in, in Turkey, it's illegal to marry more than one woman, you know, the Western ideals uh, that they got from Christianity, of course. Um, but if a man has a mistress or cheats on his wife without making a really big deal out of it, it's, it's fine. Like, as a wife, you're supposed to turn a blind eye and just kind of let it happen. Uh, because, again, the Muslim understanding of uh, sexuality is completely different than uh, um, what the church teaches. It's like, um, I don't know if you've heard that it's um, men don't have much control over their urges, so they are going to find a way to satisfy that. And as women, you're supposed to be okay with it. And so my mother was for a long time. She was completely okay with it. And of course, I'm growing up in this turmoil, but I don't know anything else, right? This is all, all I know. All I am taught is Islam. And so I go to the mosque. I memorized all the uh, Arabic prayers, and I learned how to read the Quran in Arabic. Um, and I'm very, you know, studious by nature. Um, so I just wanted to learn more and more about this religion that's really important. My parents were never observant. Uh, my mom used to and still does fast during Ramadan, but that was too much for my father. Uh, so he, he, just, um, he just didn't observe any, uh, but he's still Muslim, right? Like no man is Muslim, they're just, religion is a very, very important part of your identity, regardless of how much you practice. So I'm growing up in this, never once ever questioning it. And one of the things that, um, Again, I talked yesterday, this idea of servile fear, because um, in Islam, it is the thought that Allah is the ultimate master. So servile fear is this uh, fear this servant feels against his master uh, because of fear of punishment, right? It's not necessarily evil because, you know, um, that's, there is a little bit of that in all of us. You know, we fear hell and sometimes we uh, feel contrition because of that, and that's imperfect, right? But the perfect contrition is that we fear, which is the filial fear, we fear disappointing our Father in heaven, right? So servile fear is supposed to evolve into this filial fear slowly, like it does with my children. You know, my toddler wants to touch the stove, and I say no, and she looks at me, she's like, wow, this lady is really big, and I think she can take me, so I better listen. <laughs> or, you know, she still goes and touches the stove and gets, gets burned, but so hopefully the former. But I hope that as she grows up, she's going to learn that, hey, this lady really, really loves me and wants the best for me. And I don't want to disappoint her. I don't, I don't want to make her sad. So then she listens from that filial fear and love, right? Um, but in Islam, it, it's unthinkable that God is the father. Right? We, I, again, I talked about it for a while yesterday, so I don't want to repeat myself. So it never turns into this wonderful filial fear. So uh, one of the, um, the, I open this because this is so hard to explain to Western mind because you grow up blessed <laughs> with this idea that you have freedom. You can question and you are not bound with these. But Muslims grow up with this intense fear from an early age, but it's like being fish, right? Like all you know is water. Like you can't imagine the desert or the land. This is all you know. So uh, I want to give you an, like a concrete example. As a kid, um, you're not so you're taught that you're not ever supposed to try to picture or imagine how Allah looks like. So I think I was around seven, and one day I'm laying in bed and thinking about God, um, Allah, and I tried to imagine Him as like this fluffy, cloudy kind of being with rainbow eyes. And as I'm doing this, suddenly I was struck with this intense fear because I realized what I was doing. I'm like, oh no, he's gonna punish me, right? So I couldn't sleep that night and I wake up, I'm walking to school and um, we lived by a creek and there was these really big boulders by the creek. And I thought, oh man, those are kids like me who try to imagine Allah and they were turned into stone. I was paralyzed with fear for days and I was afraid of to walk by the creek because I'm like, he's gonna turn me into stone. So like imagine this as an early age, this is like becomes part of your being. So you never ever question, which is one of the biggest hurdles 
into um, um, for, to the conversion of Muslims. So you almost need, so there is this like wall of fear that you put up as you grow up. And it almost takes like this really traumatic event or something really um, big in your life to crack that wall. Because once you start questioning Islam, it's kind of like a house of cards, it falls apart. But to bringing these people to the point of that questioning is very hard. And for me, that crack came when my parents decided to divorce because my father was like, well, you know, it's really hard to go to, go to another house and cheat on my wife. How about I take another wife who is much younger and, um, and then she'll be here all day, right? So, uh, of course, my, my mother was um, kind of drew the line there and um, they got a divorce. And as you can imagine, it was really, really messy. So I'm around 11 or so when this happened, and I was really attached to my father. Um, and I had always had a rocky relationship with my mother because it, it, he, she was under so much pressure. Now, looking back, I understand. But as a kid, you don't understand that. Um, so it was a very uh, messy divorce. Um, there was a lot of fights and, you know, physical abuse. It was just, it was really, really messy. And it shook the ground out under me. And, you know, no matter what they say, um, how resilient children are, um, all we know in our selfishness is that, um, is that the world revolves around us. And one of the main parts of that world is, um, is our family. So my father left after telling me that he would never leave us. Uh, the, the following day he left and we didn't hear anything from him for years and years. So I realized that, hey, they, they always told me that they loved me, but now, you know, one is in deep depression and one is completely gone. Clearly, it was a lie. The fact that they loved me was a lie. What else did they lie about? Right. So that that was the so I'm 11 years old again, you know, and up until now, I had never again questioned Islam. And for the um, my first instinct was to go pray more. But the more I prayed, the more I felt like there was not nobody listening and nothing on the other side of darkness. And then I'm like, maybe this was a lie, too. Like they always told me that this was the truth, but. Maybe this was a lie too. So that's the very first time at that age I started to read the Quran in Turkish. And then I was really kind of shocked. First of all, it's very hard to read. So it's not like the Bible, it's not a, it doesn't have stories and an order. It's kind of like little, like bits and pieces of homilies, bits and pieces of stories from Judaism. So it's very hard to read. But uh, since it's our holy book, I read it in Turkish. I'm like, this just doesn't make sense. And then I went and read Muhammad's life um, from the Hadith. Because what happens is we learn uh, Islam from, like it's passed down from the Imam or our families or our teachers. So nobody goes to the Quran and then just reads the Quran or the Hadith for themselves unless you're trying to become like a scholar. So I read it and I realize this guy, Muhammad, is not somebody that I'd like to follow. Like, because first of all, I am just I don't have the you know physical properties to follow him properly, because you look at his life, he just you know he was lustful, he loved women, the way he treated his son-in-law, and you know just it, it, it was appalling the way women were treated in Islam. And then I we were always taught that um, Muslims always waged. Um, uh, war of defense. So they never attacked anybody, So right? We were always on the right. And I'm reading this, I'm like, this just doesn't look like it. <laughs> I'm sure these people were just sitting there, uh, minding their own business. And when Muhammad and his armies came and conquered him. So like, I see this like really violent man who is power hungry and lustful. I'm like, there is no way I want to follow this guy. So that was the crack in my wall, and I kind of decided not to be a Muslim anymore. Of course, growing up as a, as a Muslim, one of the first things you're taught is that Christians changed the Bible and declared uh, Jesus as God, where he had claimed ever no such thing. So um, I don't know why I never questioned it back then, 
Um, but I didn't, I thought like Judaism, Christianity, all of that was all that similar kind of nonsense, right? I just didn't know well enough. So I kind of pushed all kind of religion aside. Um, so like by 12 or so, I am, I am an atheist now. So I didn't quite, um, it was more like rejection of religion rather than really thinking and embracing atheism. So what happened is um, my family had, was the only, my parents were the only divorced parents I knew in my school. So I felt very odd and ostracized. And now as an atheist, then again, I felt like, you know, just I don't have any friends, I don't have anybody. But eventually I found a couple other friends whose, excuse me, his, uh, whose parents were um, communists. So we, I, we, I kind of bonded with them. So, um, you know, we had this like little weird r ragtag group that got drunk on Saturdays at age 12 and then played chess and re read, you know, Russian classics. Like it was just like this really um, weird combination, you know, <laughs> just uh, geek and drunkenness. Um, we were just very confused, you know. Um, so I started to read a lot more about, you know, kind of science became my God. We were reading all the classics and trying to understand. Um, so, but weirdly, I think I was 13 when um, Lord of the Rings was translated into Turkish. And we just, you know, that was one of the things we, we read, you know, so the Lord still kind of, um, you know, puts little bits of graces as you, um, as you, as, um, you travel. So anyway, um, throughout middle school and high school, I completely lost any moral compass whatsoever I had. So um, I drank a lot, and I'm glad that I grew up in Turkey and not in America. I think I would be a drug addict by the time, uh, by the time I finished high school. So I drank a lot, um, and then, you know, we read a lot. <laughs> Again, you know, played chess, had geeky conversations and all that. And I had this little rag talk group, but I was also leading a very, very sinful and destructive life, even though no drugs. It was still very destructive. So all I wanted to do was to get out of this little town I lived, um, and I did. I went to college, but in Turkey, um, I, um, it's very community and family oriented. So when you go to college, your uh, parents support you throughout college. So it's like high school basically, but in a different town. But of course my family was so broken, so messed up that I didn't have anybody. So I had to work and I was the only one that worked in my class. Um, so, but I'm like, how do you find work that accommodates, you know, full-time study? So one day I'm waiting at the, at the bus stop and I'm thinking, okay, like how am I gonna find a, um, find a job? And there's, I saw this little flyer on the bus stop. It says, an American lady is looking for a um, college student who speaks English for, uh, to teach her Turkish. So my English wasn't this good, but you know, I had started to learn when I was um, 12, so I spoke well enough. But I looked at the flyers like, with my luck, she's already found somebody. So I went, you know, went about my day and um, got home at night. So it's around like 10 o'clock and I'm, you know, in my pajamas and slippers sitting. And like, I hear this voice. He says like, go get the number, go get the number. I'm like, oh. like it's 10, but it's just this nagging in my head won't stop, which I didn't know who he was back then, but we all know who he is now. Um, <laughs> So I'm like, fine. So I just like shuffle to the bus stop in my slippers, write the number down. And it's like a big no-no to call anybody after nine in Turkey, but the voice won't stop. So like I call this lady and she hadn't found anybody. She's like, why don't you come and um, we'll have an interview. So I show up there at the following, the following day. Uh, so she opens the door. Um, First of all, she's not blonde, which I'm like, what kind of American is not blonde? <laughs> and um, are you saying the Hollywood movies have been lying to me? And I'm like, where is the miniskirt and the cleavage lady? <laughs> um, so, <laughs> so she opens, you know, she's like modestly dressed and, um, you know, smile on her head. She opens and there is this, um, this should tell something. I name, I changed all the names uh, to protect, you know, their lives back there. But she's named Therese in my book. Um, so she, Therese opens the door and right across, like this is the main door, 
there's a Bible verse cross-stitched on her wall it's in a Muslim country. So like this lady clearly isn't afraid and it's, it's, it's from the book of Acts. It says there's no salvation under heaven except by his name. I'm like, oh, great, she's Christian. I don't even know how I was, you know, I'm like, okay. So we go in, we have a chat and so she hires me. And um, so we start talking. And by this time, I, I want you to remember that I am 19 years old and know everything. <laughs> so I'm like, I'm going to help this lady who, you know, believes in God and fairy tales and such to come to the light of truth. So, um, like, I've never been a relativist um, by the grace of God. And I was like, okay, you know what? Um, so... Truth is, like, my truth is dark, right? You know, I am very sarcastic, which changed a little bit since then. Um, <laughs> but um, it's dark and miserable, but it's truth, right? I mean, it doesn't matter if it's dark and miserable if it's the truth. And, you know, so, like, I will help you find this truth, lady. So little did I know, she grew up in an atheist home, uh, went to a really prominent college here in America, and then she uh, converted um, while she was in college. And um, she and her husband had a really you know, prosperous, good lives here. And she felt the call to serve as missionaries in Muslim countries. So they had just moved to Turkey not long ago when I met her. So of course, I don't know any of this. So we start studying. And she doesn't even have to start talking about uh, Christianity because I'm like, let me help you with that. So I am the one who opens the conversation. And um, she was wonderfully patient and, you know, read a lot and very knowledgeable, like exactly somebody I needed. So from the first time we met for three and a half years, Therese and I met three times a week, two and a half hours a day for three and a half years. And I don't think we've ever talked anything other than God, you know, the Bible. I read the Bible from, you know, um, uh, cover to cover in Turkish, you know. Of, this is one of the things, they, in, the ways they introduce, like you kind of learn Turkish through reading the Bible. So, uh, of course, slowly I am being exposed to this new God in a way. And again, like yesterday I mentioned, I'm not saying we believe in completely different gods, but the way Islam understand God is, com is very, very different than God the Father. So for three years, she and I talk, and then I realize um, that this God she's talking about is completely different. One of the things that always bothered me as I read, as this, you know, this is just geeky 80s, that how fine-tuned the universe is to life on Earth. Like, the more you read, like, it's, you know, if it was a little bit off, like, the world wouldn't, the Earth wouldn't exist or human life wouldn't exist. Like, it was just perfectly fine-tuned. And somehow all these scientists who didn't believe in God expected consistency across the universe. And I'm like, there's a void between all these galaxies. Like, how do we know physics or chemistry work the same? Why couldn't it be completely different? But of course, they believe it's consistent without knowing that it is created by a consistent, loving being, right? So those, and then um, and the beauty, even though um, I believe that the sunset, the beauty of sunset was created by, you know, the accidental sun rays and the interaction of clouds and humidity or whatever, like you just, you can't get rid of this feeling that it's just painted by somebody almost, right? Like, you know, the, the beauty in the nature is just so overwhelming sometimes. But of course, like I'm pushing those aside, but as I'm talking to Therese about this God, who loves truth and beauty, it's just started to slowly make sense, which I did not like. So I would just get so mad. But I wasn't a very well thought out, you know, 80s, as I said. And I'm like, look, somebody probably taught, you know, like thought about this. So I would just go home and just try to read up and find objections. But you can't find an objection to beauty or how fine-tuned the, the, you know, the universe is. So slowly I started to see, and um, she was the first pro-life woman I've met. 
and again, like I share, um, I share about my own experiences, um, you know, during the dark years of um, um, high school and college, that like I had never met anybody pro-life because Islam isn't necessarily pro-life. Um, like in Turkey, abortion is allowed to a certain, I think it's till 10 weeks. They say um, life begins when the quickening happens. Like that's when Allah infuses the body with soul. So um, he, she was the first pro-life I met, but she also has made sense because like the more I read about, you know, um, anatomy and science, you realize like the heart starts beating so early. Why can't he be a person? So all of these things that she talked about started to really make sense. And she was very... Um, like, it just was almost like her belief in God was very, like, holistic and consistent. And I realized that God could exist, which is a big deal, right? You know, um, again, Curtis talked about Pascal's wager. I mean, if, if God exists and you don't believe in him, you're in big trouble. And if God exists, then I'm missing a really, really big truth. And if God exists, there's an eternal life, and my life on this earth is like a blip. Right, like nothing else matters really if God exists. And I mean, if it doesn't exist, like there isn't much you're gonna lose. You know, you'll live that as a stupid Christian. Like, what's gonna happen? You know. So, but I mean, I'm not thinking that. But it's I'm thinking that like, okay, this could my tr what I believe as truth doesn't seem very true anymore. So, um, but one of the biggest differences between me and Therese was. Um, our understandings of human nature. Uh, so, okay, so in Islam, there isn't a consistent um, theology of human nature. Of course, like unthinkable that we are created in God's image. There isn't a consistent um, uh, theology of, about sin because, you know, um, Allah, like all, a thing is a sin because Allah says so. Like, he can change his mind tomorrow, and who are you to say otherwise? Does it make sense? So um, it's a completely different understanding of sin, whereas in Christianity, I think, is sin because it is not good for us. And God cannot look upon sin. It's because he's, oh, he's unable, or like he's somehow limited because he's so holy and good, right? So like, it's, again, completely different. So I, I didn't quite understand how this worked. So um, along with being an atheist, I was, of course, you know, <laughs> a communist, because this is what I thought, that all humans are inherently good, right? So we are all inherently co good. There's crime and evil. Or, I mean, I wouldn't call it evil, like, you know, crime and wars on Earth. So, like, how does this happen if we are all inherently good? I believed that it's because of external factors. Like, there, are, there were rapists because of uh, society's um, like really heavy uh, uh, expectations of sexuality, right? Uh, people committed murder because they were in poverty, they grew up bad, whatever, right? It was always, it was never the person's fault, it was always an external factor. And the reason I was communist, which you will, you know, um, I see that it's coming back, if there is no internal reason then there is, everything is external, then we can come up with a system that could remove all these external factors and cre create paradise on earth. And because once you remove all these evil external factors, then all you're left with good, you know, benevolent human beings. So like, um, as a Protestant, and she was a, she still is a five um, point Calvinist, she, you know, she believed in the to total deprivation of um, uh, human, uh, human nature because of the original sin. So it's just that, that didn't quite make sense to me that like, because I still saw goodness in people, you know? So that was one of the things. So I could, I could never um, get over that. So uh, my struggle with there is reached to a point, okay, even if there is a God, I don't want to believe in this God who lets all these evil things happen, which is called the problem of pain. And a lot of people get stuck in it because of that like improper understanding of sin and who God is. So thankfully, God is very patient with me, as you can see. Uh, so I'm about 22 now, right? Almost 22. 
And uh, so I went to a really good college in Turkey and uh, university in Turkey, and the education language is English. So, but uh, everybody's Turkish professors are Turkish, so once in a while they bring this uh, professor from abroad, uh, from America, so that we can hear, you know, proper um, accent. Doesn't change my accent <laughs> all these years. Um, and like just, you know, learn it for, from a native speaker. So we had a Fulbright scholar um, from Denver University back then. Uh, he was a Buddhist and he did not like Christians at all. So, um, uh, so one of the, so um, one of the um, assignments he gave to us, uh, he, <laughs> it was from uh, Dostoevsky, uh, from a book called Brothers Karamazov. I don't know if um, you're familiar with it, but there's a, if, I mean, it's a really big book, great book if you can read all of it, but if you can't, find this chapter because it kind of stands on its own. Okay, so there are four brothers. It's, um, this conversation is taking uh, place between Ivan, who is the oldest brother and who is a very hardcore communist, and Alyosha, who is the youngest brother, who is a novice monk. So Ivis is, uh, Ivan is trying to convince, uh, persuade Alyosha that um, this God he, stuff he believes is ridiculous. So this is the parable he tells him. So uh, this is happening in, um, it's very anti-Catholic, so excuse the, <laughs> uh, you know, Dostoevsky was, was an Orthodox, but nobody is uh, perfect and will let him um, go for that. So, um, so this is taking place in, during the Spanish Inquisition. So uh, Jesus comes back to earth. It's not the second coming. He's just kind of checking out how things are going. And pe but people recognize him for who he is. So he goes and heals a blind man, raises a little girl from the dead. But I mean, he doesn't talk because he said everything he did, right? Um, so, uh, and it, he's gathering this followers around him. And then uh, this cardinal, the grand inquisitor, passing by with his guards, and he realizes how people are kneeling and worshiping him. And he tells his guards to go and arrest Jesus. And nobody, all these people, like, don't say anything, even though they saw his miracles. So he puts Jesus um, in, the, in a dungeon, and at night he goes. And he's really upset that he's there. He says, why did you come back? We've been trying to clean up your mess this whole time. And he said, you know, when Satan tempted you um, in, the, in the desert, you should have accepted his offer. He said, he asked you to turn the rocks, you know, he fasted and then went to the desert. And he said, he asked you to turn these rocks into bread and you said no. And, um, and you know, because I, I, I'm not Scott Hahn, I can't memorize all the, <laughs> all, all the verses. You know, and our Lord responds that man shall not live by bread alone, but every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. And he said, no, what you should have done, you should have started turning uh, rocks into food and starvation in the world. Give these uh, clueless people the security they so desire. And he says, when he took you upon the cliff and... Um, uh, and he told, told you, look, you know, it's told that the angels won't let you fall. Why don't you throw yourself? And our, and our Lord said, you shall not tempt the Lord your God. No, no, no. What you should have done is just show these amazing signs and miracles instead of shrouding yourself in subtlety and mystery and give them freedom to, like, chase you, right? And he said, when, the, when Satan asked you to worship him, you should have worshipped him and claimed the power he offered you and created a universal state and bring order to this created world. Because this is all these people, uh, the, these, your, your people crave. They crave security and order. All you wanted to give them was freedom. So I'm reading this chapter. Oh, hang on. And um, so the... And then, um, so Jesus gets, oh, and Cardinal opens the door of the dungeon as if Jesus needs him to open the door, right? Um, and then he says, go away and never come back. So Jesus gets up, kisses Cardinal on the cheek, and he leaves. And so Ivan ends up telling this parable and turns around, and Alyosha gets up and kisses his brother on the cheek, and he leaves. So, I mean, it's, it's beautiful. It's beautiful. So it's the middle of the night. 
It was like this old English translation from R Russian, right? And I drank too much coffee. I had a big dictionary. So I'm like sleepless, but I'm thinking in the middle of the night for the first time, I saw what sin is, right? Because up until now, I'm thinking, like I'm blaming all everybody else. Like everybody's a victim, right? It's always somebody else's fault, especially, you know, in, in my own life. And I felt like when I read the Grand Inquisitor, it just showed me a mirror to, into my own soul. And I saw how my own sins, the stuff I did affected so many people, right? No man is an island. And the sins of my father completely changed my life. And I hurt so many people myself because of, you know, it's just there is, there is this rippling effect of sin. And I realized there's poverty in the world because we sin, because some people take more than others, right? We are not willing to share. You know, there are rapists because they're broken on the inside. You know, it's not because, oh, they weren't satisfied sexually. So I understood that it wasn't God who was evil, it was me. And that was, a, that was the last intellectual stop for me as far as. So of course, like most of the stuff is solved here, but you know, it's a long run, they say, between the head and the heart. So that summer, Therese went, came back to America for like a sabbatical because, you know, missionaries need breaks from these crazy, um, crazy Turks. And um, I'm like, oh, no, now I don't have money. What happens? And the Lord is like, fine. So he gives me another family. But this time, I am teaching two little kids. I think they were three and six. And now um, um, when I'm teaching this, I'm really running out of time. I do talk to I got I got kicked out of the chapel yesterday, if you were <laughs> there. Is, uh, it was not pretty. Um, so... So I started to teach these two kids, and they are also missionaries in Turkey. But this family, this is the, really the first time I was really immersed in the life of a Christian family, which, which is something I had never witnessed, and it's something I have never seen. And this is one of the biggest witnesses as Christians, the faithfulness of Catholics and the joy and love in our life. Like there is no, nothing else, no argument, no discussion can replace this. This is amazing. It's such a silent and beautiful witness. So I go to this house and the kids aren't afraid of their parents. And like I lied a lot to get out of trouble when I was a little kid. Um, again, because there isn't an understanding of your, you know, that filial fear. Um, and these kids just love their parents and they, you know, they didn't lie. And uh, the parents like disciplined so lovingly, so caringly. And the husband served the wife, the wife served the husband. Like, I mean, it's just like beautiful harmony. I'm thinking, are they faking this? <laughs> I'm like, I'm thinking I leave and it's like, a, you know, regular crazy Turkish family, right? And I'm like, what is this? So, but I don't want to leave the house. Like, I mean, a few times actually she had to tell me to leave because it's midnight. I'm not kidding because I'm like, I'm, I want to be in this. Like, I want to be part of this, right? So now I am realizing that this, everything I've been reading and learning for years goes into this, turns into this. It's not all this old intellectual exercise, but it completely transforms your life, your life, your family, your society. That's why we owe, you know, everybody we know to like tell them the Christ like we have to share it so their lives can be transformed right so it, it, it was such a like this love and joy in their life was palpable and I had never seen anything like this and I didn't want to live that leave that and I wanted it I wanted it so like that was the big road but now I'm thinking okay so I go to so this is my junior year in college now I'm thinking it's like I'm about to graduate, get a really good job in the government, finally have money because I've always been poor. Like, I can't do that. You know, I am um, I have an bo atheist boyfriend, so that's going to be a great conversation if I became a Christian. Um, my friends and I, like everybody I know is atheist and, you know, really smart people, and we sit around at the bar, make fun of people who believe in God. I mean... That's, again, going to be a very awkward conversation, <laughs> you know? So, like, I couldn't give up all these earthly stuff, right? 
So on like four, four weeks, I'm like, okay, okay, how am I gonna do this? I'm like, I, I don't wanna do it, I can't, I can't. So I'm like at this crossroads and I couldn't cross that final, like just like standing there kind of paralyzed. Thankfully, the Lord is patient again. One day, I'm more, I'm, one morning, I'm going to, um, I'm going to my um, class and I'm very awake. Again, look, I'm still kind of, you know, basically atheist, so I don't believe in dreams and all that stuff. But I'm awake, so because the Lord knows. And I had this uh, vision, and it was very quick. Um, so in the, um, so I see this um, like glorious mountains, and there's a meadow um, in front of it, and there's this little girl in white sitting down on the ground in the grass and playing with these little toys in her lap. While she's playing, there are two uh, hands coming down from the sky like this. And these hands are so big, like the owner of these hands are so big, you can only see the hands. And they're like trying to give this present to this little girl. And this present, you realize it's not like, um, like an earthly present, right? It's like glowing and you realize that it's bigger than something this girl could ever, ever imagine, right? It's just, it's just this amazing gift. And she doesn't even see that this gift is being handed to her, right? So she's still playing. And finally, she looks up and sees the gift, and she says, oh, no, thank you. I have these little things to play. I'm like, are you stupid? <laughs> How could you possibly compare your toys that are, like, I can't even see it in my vision, like, they're so tiny, with that gift that you will be opening for eternity. And then I realized, I'm like, oh, that's me. I'm like, yeah, the Lord wasn't being subtle that day. I think he had like, okay, we're done with this, you know. So, um, so the following day, I go um, to this, this, this wonderful family, and she was doing the dishes. The wife was doing the dishes, and she, I, I told her, I was like, I think it's time. I think this is a good day to become a Christian. And they're evangelical Christians. You should drop the place, and we prayed the prayer, and we cried, and all that stuff. And... Um, that was my conversion in this, you know, in this like three. <laughs> um, it's like the Lord pursued me for all these years, but you know, I finally got the message when she, he slapped me upside the head. Um, so I converted, you know, there was a Bible study and I was so afraid that I was gonna be the only weird Chris, Turkish Christian, but no, you know, um, I started meeting other uh, converts from Islam and um, Bible study and all that. But as I'm reading this, like there are a few things that didn't quite make sense about um, what the Protestants believe. So um, I talk about this in depth and I'm sure you've heard all this stuff, so I'm not going to, uh, but there were four things that really confused me. Um, so sola scriptura, right? Uh, Bible alone. Like, I don't understand. Like. He just left and he said, hang in there, I'll send a book in a few hundred years. You know, I'm like, I mean, where? <laughs> I mean, where did the Bible come from, right? Like, I mean, because like, Quran is kind of, is believed that St. Gabriel um, dictated to Muhammad, which is crazy enough, but I'm thinking this just, I don't understand where this came. So I'm like, I pushed it aside. Sola fide, faith only didn't make sense. Like as soon as we said the prayer, we didn't have free will anymore, right? So that didn't make sense. I'm like, I'm reading and trying to make sense. It's not working. And lack of a magisterium was a big deal for me because I'm reading the Bible, Jesus leaves, and guess what? St. Paul and St. Peter are already fighting. I'm like, the man just left. Can you may have peace, you know, just, just a little bit, just for one year. And I'm like, how could a God who loved us so much so that he became one of us would just leave us without anything? Like, I mean, he knows us so well. It just didn't make sense as he wouldn't leave us with somebody in charge because he knows us so well, right? So, and, um, and I met all these Protestants and they disagree on everything, right? Like, I mean, are we reading the same book? Why are we all disagreeing on these like really important stuff? Like it's not, you know, minute details. Like Protestants read the same Bible, they disagree on abortion or salvation issues. Like these are really important stuff, you know? So that didn't make sense. And the fourth one was um, like, I was, you know, 
long time 80s, so I really believed in evolution. And all the Protestants I knew were creationists. And I'm like, are you saying he couldn't have used evolution? Right, that like didn't make sense again. Um, it was, that wasn't as big of a deal, but it just didn't quite fit what they were what they were saying. So, but I'm like, I'm just gonna push all this stuff aside. Clearly, you know, I don't know enough. Uh, so I started to, you know, read more. Uh, you know, started to serve in the church. And one of the ministries I helped with, that me and a few other friends of mine, we um, we ran this uh, camp for Turkish Christian teenagers. So it was the only camp of its kind in the country, and uh, we. Um, we had it like behind the walls of Ephesus. It was just beautiful, beautiful. And one of the people I met there was a missionary kid who, um, who grew up, um, who is an American, but grew up in Turkey. Uh, his parents were missionary. And he went to, um, he, uh, went to college here at Notre Dame. And um, we had the same major and, you know, he was, he's just a wonderful, wonderful, uh, really fun person to be around, had great connection with teenagers, so we worked a lot. And we became good friends over the years. So when he finished Notre Dame, he came back to Istanbul um, uh, to work there at a, as a journalist. And I was in Ankara, and I was getting my master's, because remember, now I'm as a Christian, I could never get a government job in Turkey. But I figured, you know what, if I go get my PhD, I can work at a private college. And if you keep your head down, don't make too much noise, they kind of let you be. So I'm trying to, you kind of learn to function within the system, right? So, and I have a very agnostic roommate, and we're going to a conference in Istanbul, you know what? I'm gonna go get Anthony, again, I changed his name and um, here in the Bible, because he's, he's, he's a priest now, and he serves in Muslim countries, in my book, not the Bible, duh. Um, so, um, so, I go to Istanbul and I'm like, okay, we're gonna, I'm gonna meet with Anthony and he, um, and uh, I'm gonna bring my roommate who's, who's with whom I've been sharing the faith and between Anthony and I will get her. <laughs> so I got, go there, so we're <laughs> having lunch and Anthony says, okay, daddy, I'm gonna tell you something, but don't be mad. And I'm like, what could it be, right? Like, what could it be? And he's like, I become Catholic. No, you didn't. <laughs> How could you? So I'm surrounded by Calvinists, like Southern Baptists, like the thought of Catholics is just like, you know, makes them want to rip their, <laughs> their clothes and put ashes on their head. Um, and also like in Turkey, like um, you watch all these old Turkish movies and uh, all the bad guys are Catholic and they're wearing big tabard with a cross and they're like liars, cheaters, they tempt women. And there's um, one virtuous Turkish hero and um, eventually the, you know, the lewd Christian lady falls in love with him and becomes Muslim and they live happily ever after while all the evil Catholic soldiers are dead, right? <laughs> so, I'm like, like, it's just kind of, it's, you grow up with it, it's just like becomes your subconscious almost. Like you just don't like Catholics. And the Ottoman Empire sided with the Protestant princes during the reformations, you know? So anyway, I'm like, the Catholic church is the, you know, whore of Babylon. I don't even know who that is, but I know it's the Catholic church. <laughs> um, and, uh, and the Pope is the antichrist, you know? Like I have all this stuff, but I know nothing about Catholicism. So here, Anthony, during this lunch we were gonna, that we were going to convert my roommate, um, <laughs> Anthony and I are like basically like fighting. And he's just a bless his heart. He's such a gentle, wonderful, patient soul, unlike myself. And of course, my roommate is thinking, oh, look, the Christians are fighting again. I should have <laughs> brought popcorn, you know? So needless to say, my, my friend stays and, you know, agnostic to this day. So... I go back to my dorm room and you know, because like I figured everything out. So I'm like, I think I'm around what, 25 now. Clearly I didn't know everything by 19, but surely by 25, I know everything. So I go to the library. Uh, I mean, the internet wasn't, you know, such a big deal. I'm just that old. So I, I go back to the library and I'm looking um, through like books on Catholic theology. So there's one book in the whole library, which is a really good library, Turkish standards, it's written by this guy called Joseph Cardinal Ratzinger. <laughs> a 
it's called like Introduction to Catholic Theology. It's like this book, it's published by Ignatius Press, right? Um, I don't think the Ignatius Press pays me enough for all this stuff. Um, so I, I pick it up and like, oh, sit down. I'm going to like refute this guy. <laughs> I mean, the arrogance. So I open it. I don't even understand the introduction of this introduction book, <laughs> right? And I'm like, hee hee hee. And I close it, you know, put it back. I mean, I didn't know he was the Pope. Like, <laughs> I'm just like that clueless. So I go back to my room. There's a, um, there's a package waiting for me. And um, it's from Anthony. He sent me a book. And he said, so that you know that I'm not completely insane. So it's like this tiny volume called By What Authority, written by a, um, a, you know, a former evangelical who became Catholic. And he looks at all the main teachings of the Catholic Church and gets what? Ties them to the scriptures as if Catholics have anything to do with the Bible. <laughs> um, so like, I mean, it's just, it, like, it just made so much sense. And guess what? You remember all that stuff? Sola Scriptura, Sola Vida, Magisterium. Guess what? The Catholic Church has an answer for it, right? So I'm like, oh no, this can't be. <laughs> I was like, oh no. So um, this, I live, Ankara is like a city of five million. There are two Catholic churches. Um, one is on Vatican Embassy, masses in English, and one is on the uh, grounds of uh, French Embassy, and they have mass in Turkish. But it's Turkey, so you can't just walk into the Catholic Church, you know, this, it's not open. So I go find a building, but it's like, like there are like um, cast iron doors and all that stuff, everything is locked. So I start calling them. And this lady answers um, Turkish. It's like, no, the priest can't talk to you, the priest can't talk. So I call, call, and every day I'm completely frantic, like, no, now what am I gonna do, you know? I'm not gonna tell Anthony yet that I'm gonna become Catholic. <laughs> I just want to make sure, you know, it's just, you know, eating the humble pie is never easy. So I call and call and call, and finally, priest said, this, like, this guy picks up with this really, really bad Turkish, and he's like, why do you keep harassing my people? And I'm like, can you just meet me? I don't know what's going to happen. I've just read all this Catholic stuff. He's like, fine. Because they're, you know, they're afraid that I'm this government agent trying to entrap them into, you know. Um, so they would get in a lot of trouble if they evangelized. So uh, it's the Jesuits running this, you know, uh, Curtis was mentioning. It's the Jesuit church. So I go, you know, somebody opens the iron gates and somebody opens the indoors and we, we just go. And it's like, I think like 65, 70 year old, old Jesuit priest. He served in Chad for 35 years and they sent him to Turkey three months ago. And he's French. So... Back then I spoke French, so between French, English, and Turkish, like it makes like one kind of understandable language. He realizes that I am not a government agent. <laughs> and then I'm just like crying and falling apart. He said, okay, you start coming to mass. And um, they don't have RCIA, so like they had a, um, they studied the gospel of Matthew, so I joined that. And um, then I realized that, you know, after all, Anthony was right. So I told him, <laughs> I, t I told him, of course, he rejoiced. He's not going to say, oh, I told you so, you know. And he's been a wonderful, wonderful friend to me and my family since, they, um, since then. And then uh, right before I got confirmed there uh, in Ankara, I um, moved to England for my PhD. And the priest, the wonderful Jesuit priest, asked me to um, go and, be, you know, uh, be confirmed there and become, a, you know, like kind of adopt that uh, parish as my family. So I moved to England, and in the 2000, Easter of 2008, I was confirmed and received the Eucharist for the first time. So... Um, so when um, I was on journey home a few years ago, and they asked me, like, what do you want your byline to be? Like, former Islam, former Muslim, former atheist. <laughs> I'm like, just put them all. I've been wrong many, many times, right? <laughs> but by the grace of God, um, I got there. And, you know, 30 years for its, you know, 30th conference year, you know, the Lord brought me here. And... Uh, and I am so joyful. 
I'm so joyful after all these years for his patience and for everything he has given to us. And I am so very grateful. I implore you to always remember the joy of your salvation. Thank you.